So why I have to see my islands divided? I want to unify the United States because if I want to cross there, I have to stop to transit the borders to show my passport. Why? Why in one country? It's here that we can understand what happened even from a geographical point of view. Since 1974, we had the Turkish invasion. We consider the northern part of Cyprus as occupied part of Cyprus. Okay, the problem started when uh, some of them, they wanted to unite it with Greece. They couldn't see that it's not possible because we had guarantor powers. We couldn't do that. We're in Cyprus, in the city of Nicosia, which is one of the last divided capitals in Europe. We've come this far to understand the historical, social and political reasons behind this division. Since 1974, Nicosia has been split in half by the so-called Green Line, a demilitarized buffer zone under United Nations control. This buffer zone actually cuts across the whole Cypriot territory, separating the Republic of Cyprus in the south from the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, which is practically the least recognized state in the world. Only Turkey considers it legitimate. Additionally, the UK has two enclaves in the south of the island, the military bases of Akrotiri and Dekelia. In other words, Cyprus is governed by four different authorities. I'm sure what you're all about to see reveals sides of an island that's not really talked about enough. But first, let's truly understand what Cyprus is all about. Located at the far east of the Mediterranean Sea, Cyprus has always been a coveted island, serving as a natural crossroads between Europe, Africa, and Asia. Before being conquered by the Romans in 58 BC, the island was under the influence of the Ptolemaic dynasty of Egypt for three centuries, which Hellenized both its language and customs. However, after the fall of Rome, control of Cyprus was shared between the Eastern Roman Empire and the Umayyad and then the Ayyubid dynasties, both Muslim caliphates. At the end of the 12th century, the island was conquered by the Crusaders and sold to the Knights Templar. The Templars operated under the Lusignan dynasty, which also ruled over Jerusalem and declared the birth of the Kingdom of Cyprus in 1192. In the following centuries, the island underwent significant Christianization under the influence of the Catholic Church, but also saw the parallel development of its own Greek Orthodox diocese due to its proximity to the Hellenic world. It should be noted, though, that the status quo was destined to change more than once. At the beginning of the 15th century, Cyprus was attacked and forced to pay tribute to the Mamluk Sultanate of Egypt. Given the weakness of the kingdom, the Republic of Venice, which had already had a presence on the island for centuries with its merchants, managed to buy the island in 1489. The Serenissima wanted to make it their main commercial hub in the Mediterranean. However, just a century later, in 1571, the Ottoman Empire invaded and conquered Cyprus. This was a crucial turning point in the island's history. Firstly, the expulsion of the Venetians and therefore of Catholicism meant the rise of the Greek Orthodox Church. In fact, in the Ottoman territories, the so-called millet system was in place, under which all non-Muslim minority religious communities enjoyed a certain degree of autonomy in tax and legal matters. In other words, in Cyprus, the sultans recognized the authority of the Greek Orthodox Archbishop in exchange for his loyalty to the empire. In addition to having a Turkish Ottoman governor, the island welcomed Muslim soldiers and merchants who began to settle there with their families. As a result, Cyprus became home to two communities, a majority Greek Orthodox Cypriot community and a minority Turkish Cypriot Muslim community. The demographic composition of modern Cyprus is essentially the same, except for one formal difference. Today, 99% of the so-called Greek Cypriots, about 900,000 people, live south of the Green Line, while the vast majority of the Turkish Cypriots, 300,000 individuals, reside in the north. Such a stark division is especially evident in Nicosia, the capital. In the southern part of the city, shop signs, billboards, and directions are written in Greek, and it feels like walking in any European city. Everything changes once you reach the checkpoint that divides the south from the north. We're about to cross the border. Checkpoint. Hi. Thank you. 
We're inside Nicosia, right in front of the buffer zone. We've just passed to the part of the Republic of Cyprus, and now we're heading towards the Northern Cypriot Republic, the part under the influence of the Republic of Turkey. Once you enter the northern part of Nicosia, the Muezzin calls everyone to prayer. Mosques are accompanied by Turkish signs, images, and statues dedicated to Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, the father of the Turkish nation, and double flags. One is Turkey's, the other is of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. But there's more. You might not see it clearly in the image because there's a small cloud covering it, but way over there with the drone, I managed to capture the huge flag of the Northern Republic of Cyprus. I think it's incredible. It really shows how the Northern Cypriots or rather the Turkish government, want to assert Turkey's presence to those coming from the south, from the Republic of Cyprus, in the city of Nicosia. This immense flag made of colored stones is as big as four soccer fields and can even be seen from space. Next to it stands another flag which lights up at night, accompanied by the quote, how happy is the one who says I am a Turk, one of Atatürk's most famous sayings. Why Nicosia is important in Cyprus's history? Wait, I think I'll redo that line. Just need a drink, Jacopo. Okay. Need some water? I could buy it here, there's plenty of bars. No, why would you? You have your air ups. Fresh? Even better than the bars. Before continuing our story, I'd like to thank Air Up, the sponsor that made this report in Cyprus possible. To record as much material as possible, which you'll see later, we traveled across Cyprus, often finding ourselves in complete isolation under a blazing sun and exhausting heat. Thankfully, Air Up is not just a water bottle, it's 100% natural flavored pods that add a different taste to what would otherwise be plain water. Air Up is super easy to use, especially when you're traveling abroad and need to drink something to cool off in the scorching August heat. Actually, it's October, that's fine but it's still 40 degrees in Cyprus. It's really simple. Fill your bottle with water, pull up the pod, this little capsule, in this case, watermelon flavored, and you'll get that watermelon taste that you can smell, but taste because of a simple human ability we have in us. Right, Jacopo? True, okay. Do you think they also do pork souvlaki flavor? You should know we've been eating souvlaki for three, four days straight, and I'm fed up with it. Era, please don't make a souvlaki flavor, please. And since everyone is nicer at Christmas, Air Up is no exception. On their website, you'll find all the special holiday offers, a total of six special sets. So if you also want to give something that's more than just a simple gift, just click on the link in the description, or alternatively, use this QR code with your phone's camera. While visiting Nicosia, we encountered two parallel worlds. To understand the origins of this division that seems detached from space and time, we need to go back to some more chapters of Cypriot history. In the 19th century, the Orthodox majority territories of the Ottoman Empire started to resent the presence of Constantinople, or rather, the Turkish population. The most significant uprising was undoubtedly led by the Greek independent movement, which in 1829 declared the birth of the first autonomous Hellenic Republic. The winds of revolution reached Cyprus. Here, part of the Orthodox community claimed its linguistic and religious closeness to the Hellenic world. So much so that the first governor of autonomous Greece, Ioannis Kapodistrias, requested the annexation of Cyprus. A similar proposal was later revisited in the Megali Idea, an irredentist ideology that long characterized Athens' politics, arguing that all regions with a Greek majority population should pursue enosis, or union, with what? The motherland. But it was more than just enosis for Cyprus, as it soon caught the attention of another empire, the British Empire. Following the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869, the UK saw Cyprus as the perfect maritime outpost for connecting the Mediterranean to India, its most prized colony. Meanwhile, the Ottoman Empire was trying to curb the expansionist ambitions of Tsarist Russia. So in 1878, London and Constantinople reached a secret agreement that granted the UK effective administration of Cyprus in exchange for a tribute and a promise to defend the Ottoman Empire from Russia. Officially, 
The so-called Cyprus Convention was a temporary pact, but British protectorate status remained until 1914. In fact, with the outbreak of World War I, the Ottoman Empire sided with Germany and Austro-Hungary. London saw this as a betrayal, considered the terms of the Cyprus Convention nullified, and military invaded the island. After the war ended, with the Ottoman Empire dissolved, the UK annexed Cyprus as a colony in 1925. However, there was a significant problem. The population was not at all happy. On one hand, Greek Cypriots who had studied abroad, notables and orthodox clergy, developed an anti-colonial sentiment in favor of Enosis, supported by Athens. On the other hand, the Turkish Cypriot Muslim minority feared that a future annexation to Greece could force them to flee the island. In this context, the UK remained neutral and continued to demand taxes, suppressed a series of revolts during the first half of the 20th century, and even after World War II, after enlisting Cypriot soldiers, refused to leave its colony. In short, all the conditions were set for something in the Cypriot social structure to break, igniting a fuse fueled by hatred and senselessness, ready to explode into something like a powder keg. And so it did. The first spark of the conflict was late by Makarios III, the Archbishop of the Cypriot Orthodox Church, an anti-British supporter of Enosis, and leveraging his status as a religious leader, Makarios sought support from worker associations and religious groups, both in Cyprus and in Greece, and in the UK. He preached non-violence. However, his speeches also attracted militant factions, especially the Cypriot guerrilla expert General Georgios Grivas, who had fought alongside the Greek army during World War II. A nationalist in favor of Enosis, in 1955, Grivas founded EOKA, which stands for National Organization of Cypriot Fighters. Grivas envisioned EOKA targeting British authorities, pushing London to leave Cyprus for good. But soon, things got out of hand. Following Aoka's initial bombings in major cities, British police forces integrated hundreds of Turkish Cypriots into the ranks. In the early stages of guerrilla warfare, clashes between Aoka and the British patrols led to several Turkish Cypriot policemen being killed, which fueled hatred in their community against the Greek Cypriots. After two years of limited success, Grevas, forced to retreat to the mountains, realized that the only way to divide the British forces was to disorient them. Thus, Eoka began targeting Turkish Cypriot villages and inciting intercommunal clashes between Orthodox and Muslims. Naturally, the Turkish Cypriots didn't just stand by. They too had a leader, Fazil Kuchuk, a former doctor from Nicosia who was the first to take an interest into the well-being of the Turkish Cypriot minority. Also opposed to Gnosis, Kuchuk developed the opposite idea, Taksim, meaning an actual separation between an Orthodox South and a Muslim North Cyprus, allowing the Turkish Cypriots to exercise their independence. At the time, both this solution and Gnosis were nearly impractical, for two reasons. Firstly, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots lived together throughout the island. Secondly, while Greece was still pushing for Enosis, the Republic of Turkey, founded in 1923 and rising strongly in the post-World War II era, considered the Turkish Cypriots as full Turkish citizens. After five years of civil war, the situation became unbearable and the British authorities realized that granting independence to Cyprus was the only viable way to end the violence. In 1959, all parties involved met in Zurich and drafted the first constitution of the Republic of Cyprus. This constitution divided the Cypriot population into two communities, one Greek Cypriot and the other Turkish Cypriot. Due to their majority, the Greek Cypriots could elect the president, while the Turkish Cypriots were entitled to choose the vice president, who had veto rights. With independence declared in 1960, Makarios III and Fazil Kuchuk 
were obviously selected for these roles. Moreover, in Zurich, other critical agreements were being made for future events. First and foremost, Cyprus could neither be united with Greece nor partitioned in favor of Turkey. If this condition was at risk of being violated, the guarantor power, Greece, Turkey, and the UK could intervene militarily to restore the status quo. However, the new Cypriot constitution was not enough to quell nationalist sentiments. After three years of institutional deadlock due to lack of dialogue between Greek Cypriot and Turkish Cypriot parliamentarians, Makarios III proposed abolishing the veto power of Vice President Kuchuk, thereby bypassing any possible Turkish Cypriot opposition to future decisions. This move was seen by the Turkish Cypriots as an attempt to weaken their governmental position and thus favor Enosis. Rumors of a plot began to circulate, and the resurgence of the intercommunal violence was inevitable. On the night of December 20th, 1963, following a dispute, a Greek Cypriot policeman killed a taxi driver and his partner. A British contingent immediately intervened to calm the situation in Nicosia, and on December 30th, General Peter Young drew a ceasefire line through the middle of the capital. It wasn't enough. In the days and months following, the so-called Blood Christmas triggered real programs across the country. Churches, mosques, and homes were invaded and destroyed. Over 500 people died, and more than 20,000 Turkish Cypriots found themselves homeless. Only the intervention of the United Nations eased the tension. In 1964, a peacekeeping force negotiated a ceasefire and allowed Turkish Cypriot refugees to settle in about 10 enclaves under the protection of the Turkish army. The UN mission established itself in Nicosia, along the line that General Young had drawn on a map with a green crayon. Hence the name Green Line, the same green line that today covers 1% of Cypriot territory. How did it expand to such an extent? In 1967, Greece experienced a coup d'etat by a military junta with fascist leanings. Once in power, the so-called Colonel's Dictatorship pressured Makarios III to push for the enosis of Cyprus. However, Makarios knew he couldn't provoke Turkey. His opinions had become moderate, and he tried to reduce the influence of the army, where most pro-Greek nationalists were concentrated, including EOKA founder, Georgos Grivas. In other words, Makarios had every reason to fear a coup. In 1967, after a series of skirmishes between the Greek and Turkish troops, Grivas was recalled to Athens. There, with the support of the colonels, who as history teaches us were heavily funded by the United States for anti-Soviet purposes, the general immediately began organizing a new armed group based on the defunct EOKA. In 1971, EOKA B, or EOKA II, appeared in Cyprus. Its goal, to assassinate anyone promoting a solution to the Cypriot issue, different from Enosis, and to foment intercommunal hatred. In four years, EOKA B and the colonel's dictatorship caused over 300 civilian casualties, and orchestrated five coups. The problem is that the last one was successful. On July 15, 1974, the presidential palace in Nicosia was set on fire, and El Kabi seized power. Makarios III, informed by intelligence services, escaped the assassination attempt and took refuge in London. At that point, the Ankara government contacted Athens to request the removal of El Kabi. The colonels refused, and the situation rapidly deteriorated. On July 20th, Turkey decided to intervene. Launching Operation Attila, the invasion of the island of Cyprus. In just three days, the Turkish army captured 3% of the island. As a consequence, the Greek Cypriot military forces took over the Turkish Cypriot enclaves. On July 23rd, the colonel's dictatorship in Greece collapsed, creating a dangerous power vacuum in Nicosia. 
The Turkish government had acted in accordance with the Zerk agreements, i.e. to restore the status quo. Nevertheless, there was hope that Cyprus would finally be divided into two parts, at least to protect the Turkish Cypriot minority. Under British mediation, Ankara proposed this to Athens, but Greece chose to stall. Turkey didn't wait any longer. On August 14, 1974, the Turkish army unleashed its full force, and in three days occupied 37% of the island and the northern part of Nicosia. On August 16, the UN peacekeeping force extended the Green Line across the entire Cypriot territory. We're inside the buffer zone of the Green Line established in 1974 by the United Nations. As you can see behind me, there's practically nothing. Here we have many villages abandoned by Greek Cypriots who moved to the south of the island following the invasion. The violence of the August invasion forced about 150,000 Greek Cypriots to leave their homes and seek refuge in the south of the island. Nearly 2,000 people were captured and taken to Turkish prisons, and hundreds of Orthodox churches were destroyed or converted into mosques. But this army who came from Turkey, it was not a regular army. It was barbarians. It's different to shoot somebody, and it's different to cut his head and kill and kill and kill without reason. On the other hand, in response to the invasion, the Greek Cypriot army targeted Muslim communities. In the process, over a thousand people were taken to prison camps. On August 14th, Eoka B entered three Turkish Cypriot villages, Marata, Santalaris, and Alauda, to exterminate the population. That day, 126 people were thrown into mass graves. Both Turkish and Greek Cypriot military have been repeatedly condemned for serious human rights violations by various international bodies. There's no side to take. War and brutality, unfortunately, are interchangeable synonyms. You can see this most in one place. Right now, we're in Varosha, a district of Famagosta, known for being, let's say, frozen in time since 1974. After Turkish forces invaded the city and the residents quickly fled, took what they could take, it's never been restored or rebuilt. It's completely a place suspended in time. Between the 60s and 70s, Varosha was the quintessential tourist district of Famagusta, home to Cyprus's most important port. At the time, this district was predominantly Greek Cypriot. In fact, you don't see and you don't notice Turkish names in the hotels, which clearly call back to the Hellenic world. Or at most Anglo-Saxon. Exactly. Anglo-Saxon. The place names are in two languages. They basically forgot about the Turk. That's a fact. Even though these little things might seem trivial, when put together, they create a picture where the Turkish minority has definitely been somewhat sidelined. There were VIPs who used to be on holiday here. Onassis, Kalas, Marlon Brando, Paul Newman. It's surreal. Here in Varosha, time stopped on the morning of August 14th, 1974. We had a big house in, in Famagusta, a very beautiful house. We left five men in that morning. The business, it was blooming. The people were happy. Now nobody's laughing. The aeroplanes came. Seven o'clock I was in Nicosia, in the front line, seven o'clock in the morning. While Stavros was called to fight, the 150,000 inhabitants of Famagusta fled to the south of Cyprus, and the Turkish army bombarded Varosha. Since then, the ghost district has been under Turkish control and patrolled by the United Nations. Since 2003, it's been possible to enter freely, following predetermined paths. I've been only once in these 50 years. Uh, I was in the car, I smoked a, have a packet of cigarettes, and then I said to my brother, let's go back. I didn't have the courage to, to go inside and see the situation. It was bombed anyway. I was 24. <laughs> now I'm 74. People who lost their homes or were driven out from this area have said, don't turn this place affected by such tragic events into a tourist spot. But now it's becoming an attraction in every sense helping the local economy. Like, just in a year, they've even developed the beach. It wasn't like this before. And yeah, just look at what's here with these developments. Exactly. Today, Stavros and his family, like many other Greek Cypriots, 
live in a village in the south of the island in a house that once belonged to a Turkish Cypriot who fled to the north. This home doesn't feel like home. They, they haven't been bought from the country. Half of the land uh, belongs to a Greek Cypriot and half of the land to a Turkish Cypriot. Okay. They, they haven't bought the land, so we got the land, but it's not ours. So what you see down there is a village that was abandoned after the invasion. The division of properties following the invasion is not the only controversy. In February 1975, Turkey recognized the occupied areas as Turkish Federated State. Ankara justified the invasion as a peace operation to protect the interests of the Turkish Cypriots, who were invited to move to the north. The United Nations Security Council condemned the invasion, considering it illegal. In 1983, the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus unilaterally declared its independence, de facto asserting control over the northern part of the island. In terms of international law, Northern Cyprus is an illegitimate state, an anomaly, but Turkey has done everything to mold it in its own image and likeness. This is clearly visible not only in Nicosia, but also in the historic center Famagosta and Kirenia. Girne in Turkish. Right now, we're in Girne, Kirenia, northern Cyprus. And on these beaches in 1974, Turkish troops landed to start the operation to invade the island. In northern Cyprus, there are two police forces, one Turkish Cypriot and one directly from Anatolia, and no foreign embassies exist. The Turkish lira is used as currency, Turkish is the official language, and the entire region's economy relies on subsidies provided by Ankara. Between 1974 and 2005, Turkey encouraged tens of thousands of Anatolian Turks to move to northern Cyprus as settlers. It's estimated that today the Anatolian population has surpassed the Turkish Cypriot one. Meanwhile, what we might inaccurately call southern Cyprus has followed a completely different trajectory. Since 1974, the Republic of Cyprus is recognized as the island's legitimate government. It's a democratic presidential republic and has been a member state of the European Union since 2004, although it's not part of the Schengen area. With Famagosta fallen and Nicosia divided, today's business district is Limassol, the so-called Dubai of the Mediterranean. The construction of high-rise buildings, restaurants, luxury hotels and cars leave no doubt. Limassol is uh, popular for, uh, uh, for tourists, but mostly it was very popular from uh, offshore companies mm. or maybe uh, investors from uh, Russia. In the last 10 years, Limassol Grad, as The Guardian ironically renamed it, has been literally bought by Russian investors. It's not uncommon to see signs and inscriptions translated into Cyrillic around the city. Sanctions imposed following the invasion of Ukraine have certainly negatively impacted the local economy, but the Russian presence is now entrenched, so much so that many Russians have now moved to northern Cyprus. Has the war affected the, the mm -hmm. inflow of Russian people or even Ukrainian people in here? Well, actually, um, from what I know, we have around 30,000 uh, Russians uh, living in, uh, in Limassol, mostly employees of offshore companies or Russian banks or... Cyprus is an island of contradictions, where luxury and the modern face off against decades of remnants of a bygone world. Dominated and divided by interests not so much of the population, but of politics. The Cypriot government pushes for the reunification of the island, while Turkey sees the division as a victory. The northern Cypriot territory, in fact, is rich in mineral resources, oil and natural gas. Ironically, there was an attempt at reunification in the past. At the dawn of the new millennium, the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan devised the potential Cypriot constitution that would have created a single state, the United Republic of Cyprus. Consisting of two federated states, one Greek Cypriot and another Turkish Cypriot, both communities would have had equal representation in parliament. This so-called Annan plan was put to a referendum in 2004. Ironically, the majority of Turkish Cypriots voted in favor, while the Greek Cypriots rejected the proposal. After all, the new state would have given equal decision-making power to the Turkish Cypriots, who made up only 20% of the island's population, and absolved Turkey of its responsibilities during the 1974 invasion. So Cyprus remains divided, in a perpetual stalemate. I don't think this problem will be solved by political way. Far from denying Ankara's responsibilities, 
the 1974 invasion was just the last tear in a social fabric ripped apart by decades of extreme nationalism that did nothing but fuel hatred between the communities. A reminder of this tragedy today are gutted buildings, abandoned villages, a capital divided by barbed wire, and a barren plain made of grass and silence. What you just saw is the Nicosia International Airport, which has been closed since 1974, since the invasion. It was supposed to be the main airport, but it wasn't. It got bombed and is now completely dilapidated. The only two functioning airports now are in Larnaca, the main international one, and Paphos. But it's quite striking to see how nature has reclaimed all this expanse of asphalt that's still there today. Regardless of affinities with Greek or Turkish culture, it's undeniable that the island's communities have always lived together peacefully. Not as separate entities, but as Cypriots. You know, this uh, thing is good people and bad people. The good people, the good Turkish Cypriots, they are like us, the good Greek Cypriots. But all my family and my friends, we want to unify Cyprus. We want to come together. When they ask me, they tell me where they're from. I said, I'm a Cypriot who speaks Cypriot Turkish language. I don't want to show my identity when I cross the border because we live in one country. Desiring a united Cyprus might seem like an unattainable dream, an excessive ambition. Some might just want to be able to revisit the places where they grew up. Yet imagining a united Cyprus without borders is not at all impossible. We realized this precisely during our return journey from northern Cyprus. We're here in the village of Pila, located within the Green Line and under control of the United Nations. This village is unique because it's where the Turkish Cypriot and Greek Cypriot communities live together, sharing the city's spaces, in this case, the village. They also share the administration. This probably gives us a glimpse of how much of the island lived before the tragic events of 1974, where there was a peaceful coexistence between the two communities. The island of Cyprus is now a seemingly peaceful place, where nature and fascinating architectures clash with places like Limassol and the more dystopian areas in the north. Indeed, these two Cypresses make us believe that the existence of a border is necessary. Yet so far, history and human beings have taught us otherwise.